First up we've got Claire, who's been with the Bureau for nearly 20 years now, um, in very much an operational role. She was very much involved in the Black Saturday forecasting in the lead up and now works with our um, National Operations Centre. So I'll pass over to Claire to talk about her experiences during the event, particularly with the communication in the lead up to Black Saturday. Thanks you Claire. Hi. Um, I'll first start by saying that I actually almost didn't come today to do this talk because um, with the 10 year anniversary of Black Saturday, like many people who are in the room, is who are in the room, um, I had quite a bit of feeling and emotion about that, that, um, that anniversary, so it has been a little bit of a struggle to come here, but um, after seeing some very from, familiar, friendly faces this morning, um, it's, it's helped me have a little bit more confidence. Um, so here, I'm, probably, I'm not going to focus necessarily on the meteorology because we've already had such great sessions this morning um, and then there will be some great ses sessions following me. Um, but I am going to talk about, the, I guess, briefly on the meteorology and the communication leading up to Black Saturday being a forecast event. So one of the marked um, things about the day was that it was well and truly in, um, in the media and being communicated leading up to Black Saturday. So it wasn't sort of a, an event like Ash Wednesday, which um, there wasn't as much communication in, in the lead up to, to Ash Wednesday, um, whereas Black Saturday did have a lot of communication. In fact, it was one of the first times that we had a Premier um, do a press conference and talk about weather, um, which which was, was a little bizarre for us it, it, back then, seeing uh, a non-meteorologist, a non-forecaster talking about weather, but it actually made the message even more powerful, having someone in a position of leadership um, showing that they trust the Bureau and they trust the, the information they're, they're hearing to actually get up as early as the Wednesday before Black Saturday and say that this is potentially going to be um, a very, very dangerous day. At that stage, I think they were a little bit hesitant to, to use Ash Wednesday and to make comparisons because at the time the feeling was not to, um, not, not to use language that would provoke fear, I guess, because there's still, there were, even 20 years later, there was still a lot of fear after, Black, after Ash Wednesday. Um, however, I think we've come a long way in the last 10 years where if we see a situation like Black Saturday arising again, um, we would be less hesitant to use really strong language and as a result we've had the fire danger rating system adjusted so now we do have very, very strong language, um, which I'll touch a little bit on today. So I'll just briefly start with what we do in the Bureau of Meteorology as severe weather forecasters and then talk about how different that is to what we do as an embedded meteorologist in a, in a fire centre or out at, a, at IM, an IMT. So in the Bureau of Meteorology we um, at that stage produce uh, forecasts of temperature dew point um, wind speed direction etc in and produce the FDI forecast. The FDI for, for the fire danger index would then be used for um, creating obviously the um, the fire danger rating. The Bureau would issue a fire danger rating in a warning and at that stage it, uh, anything above an FDI above 50 would generate most of the time a warning of extreme fire danger, extreme fire danger rating, and that's where it stopped. It stopped at 50. Um, I won't go into the practicalities of that. I'm sure there's others that will, um, and what the rating system was originally based on, but that's what we would do in the Bureau at that stage. On a day where we were expecting uh, a fire danger rating of more than 50, and a wind change, we would produce a wind change chart. Um, and this is the, one of the wind change charts that was produced on Black Saturday. Um, interestingly, at the time we had uh, incident meteorologists from the US out helping us because we didn't have enough staff in this, situ in this situation. 
and they were quite surprised that we would produce a wind change chart. They thought it was rather litigious that we would do that. So it was something quite unique. So the embedded meteorologist at the State Control Centre, which was the IECC at that stage, um, I was uh, one of those forecasters, myself and Kevin Parkin predominantly um, at that stage. We had been embedded in the, the IECC since 07, 08, originally as an experiment, based on the, the principles that, of what they were doing in the US. In the US, they had embedded meteorologists for about 20 years in the um, geographical area coordination centres and also at the, the National Fire Centre in Boise. Both Kevin and myself had worked at both the National Fire Centre and also uh, I had worked at the geographical area coordination centres previously leading up to Black Saturday. An incident meteorologist um, brings a little bit more to the table than what the routine fire forecasts were at the time um, being produced by the Bureau would do. That's why we were, were embedded in there. The idea was that we would be experienced people on hand to be able to have a conversation with fire agency personnel or ministers or whoever. Sometimes it would end up being about 100 people asking for a briefing um, to get a li little bit of a more in-depth understanding of, of a forecast. Um, I did want to talk about that built experience and knowledge because it all plays into why the message did go out so early for Black Saturday and I think it's very important to, to talk about it. Um, so I, at that stage uh, I had been a severe weather forecaster for, since 2004 um, in the Victorian Regional Office. In that time leading up to Black Saturday, we had the 0607 Alpine fires, which was a protracted event of nearly two months. Uh, we also had a number of other major fires in that lead up. During that time, we were doing fire weather training to fire agency personnel. Um, I was just reminded by Kevin Tolhurst in 2007 was when we did, or when I presented fire weather training um, to fire behaviourists was back in 2007. So we were already very much, um, as a, from a severe weather perspective, involved with fire agency personnel. Um, Monica Long, who is um, also one of my colleagues, um, developed training for fire weather, for fire agency personnel, for situation officers, planning officers, um, prescribed burning operations officers, a whole range of fire agency personnel. So we were very much embedded in their understanding and we had also had developed language with them that we, that we could use so that they could understand what we were saying about the meteorology. Um, the IMET training that, um, that we did in the US also added to that, being able to develop our knowledge and develop our language to be able to effectively communicate the message. Um, those interactions and that training and not with the fire behaviourists in particular was, I found, particularly valuable because I learnt a little, I learnt, well, I won't say a lot, but I learnt about fire behaviour and the practical implications um, when adding it to, to the meteorology. So an embedded MET has a whole wealth of information there that's not just about the theory, it's not just about meteorological theory and and not, um, it encompasses a lot more than just being a forecaster on the bench, as well as we call it. Um, being in the severe weather section, we also had the opportunity to do research, not necessarily publishing publishing um, uh, ten papers a year, but we, we did publish one or two papers each, um, and so we did have the advantage of having practical experience with. Um, some research experience. We also were fortunate enough to have Graham Mills delivering training to us in the severe weather section in Victoria. So we, he, he really was a demonstration of um, science to services for us. Um, and that's when we, we started to have a, a bit more of an understanding of wind change structure, etc., cetera, um, from some of that training that we had with Graham. Um, he developed a wind change rating index um, based 
within LAPS. Um, these are all tools that we used in that developing that forecast for Black Saturday. Um, as a forecaster, when you've been on the bench for a number of years, you do, I guess things do sink in after patterns, pattern recognition becomes very important and, and having that exposure to other areas such as that training research and fire agency personnel all plays into how you, how you produce a forecast. Um, understanding differences between numerical weather prediction is also very important with a forecast like this. The difficulty with Black Saturday was that, um, is that it was actually so clear cut in all the, the model forecasts as early as the weekend before. Um, it was just trying to get out, trying to put that message out that early was something that was a bit of a I'm trying to think of the right words, and anyone wants to help, that's okay. It was something that was quite difficult for us to do. So in, in, the, in the public arena of what was coming out of the Bureau, we hadn't yet got to our fire weather forecast, but embedded in the State Control Centre, we were already looking at, well, first of all, we were on the back of drought, we were on the back of a heat, heat waves, um, you know, just ch chatting to foresters and experienced fire behaviourists like Kevin Tolhurst, we, we understood the landscape was ready to go, ready to burn. Um, so then seeing such a classic setup with a wind change, record temperatures, dry conditions and, um, and off the chart instability, um, it was all very clear very early on. So the challenge was, well, how do we get that message out really, really early to the public? At that stage, that message was going was staying within the state control centre, and we're leaving that kind of messaging to um, fire agency chiefs such as Russell Rees to deliver. So the first day um, on the Monday that I came in and saw that about two days worth of previous model runs had a very similar setup for a classic fire weather day. Um, that was the first time that felt that it was necessary to really go hard and strong with this message and the confidence in the, in the computer model guidance. Um, frequently you'll hear forecasters talking about um, differences in the model guidance and we'll talk about that in terms of our uncertainty or confidence in a forecast, but in this situation the confidence was there very early on, even without all the, the great um, I guess post research understanding we've had all has all played into it, but on a practical side of things, um, it was a very clear cut forecast. It was an, an any what I would call an easy forecast to make because it was just so obvious and um, so consistent. So trying to get the language there became the difficulty, and at that stage, well, we've had plenty of extreme fire danger rating days in Victoria leading up to Black Saturday, but, but this one was more than just an extreme day of you know, in the 50s versus extreme where it's becoming uncapped. At that stage, our fire danger rating indices forecasts were capped at 100, and um, for the first time ever, we actually uncapped the index, and that's when we started seeing crazy figures into the 100s and 200s coming when you input the AWS data. So, yeah, so that first Monday and Tuesday, um, I really did have to talk about comparisons to Ash Wednesday, and I know we've already talked about Ash Wednesday is it was a different day, but just trying to put it into the context, this, this is the worst situation I've seen in, in any of my experience. Um, that, and then talk about that confidence. That message then, um, was given to the to ministers and the premier over those couple of days, and then the premier made that final decision on the Wednesday to communicate that message on our behalf. This forecast you're seeing here um, was on the part of the briefing that I gave to the state control centre um, that week, and that was on the Wednesday. So, what you're seeing here is the forecast um, that we produced within the bureau of the fire danger rating uh, index 
for forest and grassland. Um, and as you can see, it's just all pretty much all red. And, we've, and I've just marked in there an approximate wind change. Um, communicating the differences in the, the timing of the wind change was also a challenge because um, even though it was a pretty clear cut day in terms of what kind of day it was going to be um, across the state, trying to explain what parts of the state were going to be worse were all dependent on the, wind sh what, the timing of the wind change. Um, at that stage, we did have that basic knowledge of, um, through the work of Graham, on the structure of the wind change, but the timing was still an issue at that stage, and even an issue on the day. We brought in a new, the Bureau had brought in a new system um, where we produced um, graphical forecasts that came from, um, uh, from gridded weather forecasts, um, and at that stage, uh, we were only able to use uh, one model, which was the Australian model, which you would all probably understand how difficult that would make um, delivering a forecast that was only using one model solution. And that model solution so happened to be quite late with the change versus some of the global model solutions. So that was another challenge in trying to communicate that to fire behaviourists and fire agency personnel trying to talk about, well, we're se have, you're seeing a bit of uncertainty in the public forecasts. Um, at that stage, we weren't talking about records necessarily, um, but there was also uh, that difficulty in trying to convey when the wind change would arrive and just how bad it was going to be. Either way, at the end of the day, it was still, I still would argue it was a pretty clear-cut day in terms of... Um, when you look at it from a very holistic perspective. The communication I used on that day, well, what do I say? This is, this is not just an extreme day. I just sort of made it up as I went and sort of absolute, absolute extreme fire weather day um, to try and communicate that message. It, within the context of the language I talked about, and I'm sorry, this is blurry, but I, I did talk about low relative humidity recovery in the night before. I talked about the stability. At that stage, we had um, crew predictions using sea hanes. Sea hanes in this is really like 10, 11, 12. Um, so nothing like we had really seen before in conjunction with this sort of day. But this made Black Saturday particularly um, interesting was that ahead of the wind change, the winds were so strong through a large depth of the atmosphere. So, on a really quick practical scale, when you've got about 100 people all wanting briefings and forecasts from you, you do have to make decisions very, very quickly. And in the terms of Black Saturday, looking at using some of the tools we use, such as looking at wind speeds at what we call 850 hectopascals or at 1500, approximately at 1500 metres, etc., wind speeds were around 50 knots. Um, I hadn't seen that before. Um, in any of my forecasting in the diagnostics ahead of a, wind ahead of a change. Um, so already we were getting a sense that you know, winds were going to be extremely strong that day. Um, at that stage I was talking about initially a dry, gusty wind change. At that stage I even mentioned um, potential um, lightning from um, from thunderstorms generated from fires, but it was a sort of crude sort of reference to that, but it was still it was still a reference all the same. And did talk about some of the numbers being well and truly above 80. So yeah, so this was the forecast that I wrote uh, on the Monday. Um, starting to hint how bad it was. And then just sort of past here. Then that was um, the Wednesday forecast. So there you can see a little bit more detail there for relative humidity. So trying to use the language that fire agency personnel are most familiar with is very important, um, opposed to our research or MIT speak. Um, and then uh, 
this was the the, you know, the forecast that we issued from the bureau, the, the regional forecasting centre, where, where we started to when we uncapped um, the hundred and started to see those crazy crazy figures popping up. And then again, trying to struggle with language. This is the the forecast that was issued on Black Saturday, where we started to talk about the numbers that we were seeing. Pyrocumulonimbus, uh, yeah. Chow was developing well behind the change, which was important to take note of. Uh, and again, just a, an approximation of where the wind change was going to be at that stage. So, I just added this in here and talk a little bit about. I wasn't on in the State Control Centre on Black Saturday. I was there the whole week leading up to Black Saturday. But my colleague Kevin was at was at the State Control Centre that day and um, part of the job of being a fire weather forecaster in that role is that you're also trying to give as much weather intel as possible and having a, the 3D radar um, at our disposal and also we, we have extensive training and understanding how to decipher 3D radar imagery obviously as part of our thunderstorm training as well um, being able to talk about, you know, we can see blue on the, the 3D radar also added to, um, to that weather intelligence and I, I, I'm not, I can't speak for Kevin but I'm pretty damn sure he would have been delivering this information during the day. Um, yeah, so look, I'll, I'll probably leave it at there, I've probably missed a few things but I just wanted to highlight that um, that the embedded MET role is a very, very, it's a key part of the service, particularly with working with the fire behaviourists. Um, having a, a much more in-depth understanding of the meteorology and being able to apply your experience um, to that role is important with sitting alongside fire behaviour analysts. Um, we have, if you have that practical experience and, you know, a fire behaviour analyst has had a little bit of training in the meteorology but might not necessarily remember everything they were taught about the aerological diagram and a lot seem to fear the aerological diagram. It's very useful having a meteorologist sitting there being able to talk through, well, look, we're looking at the wind profile here. We're seeing wind speeds that are in the, your transport, um, transport levels that are exceeding 50 knots. I'm just sort of giving a general sort of example here. or we're seeing instability that is, is through the roof or you can see that the potentially if a, a plume develops it's going to reach a mixing depth of, in the case of Black Saturday, of up to five kilometres, etc. It's all important information into adding to a better product for the, the fire, fire prediction um, and therefore being able to lead to, to better forecasts and better, sorry, better warnings being issued. Um, I'll leave it there.